Hello, welcome to the second class of uh, week 4. Uh, we began this week with uh, an introduction to various elements of literature, especially elements of poetry. Uh, this is going to be a continuation of uh, the discussion that we have had. So, before we proceed, let us have a quick recap of uh, what we did in the previous class. We discussed the importance of uh, a figure of speech and we brought out parallels between a rhetoric device and uh, you know a figure of speech. What we call a rhetoric device becomes a figure of speech in poetry and how whether it is a rhetorical device or a figure of speech there is a kind of a deviation from the ordinary use of words here and because of this deviation it adds it adds novelty to uh, be it speech or poetry as well as it increases the impact on the reader or the listener well therefore you can broadly call it a kind of a figurative language not a non literal language or a figurative language uh, we also discussed how uh, when used in writing or when used in speaking these devices enhance the beauty of uh, uh, writing and uh, speaking activity and how it takes language to a level deeper than the surfacial uh, uh, meaning you know so it takes language to a degree deeper and make and 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 makes it you know makes it work wonders in fact as a result of this it's going to leave uh, the reader with a sense of awe you know in other words it's a device that's used to create uh, uh, a sense of wonder in the readers and the listener so, here these uh, figures of speeches, uh, they not only reveal the, uh, re the writer's uh, interests and the intent, they are also used to create you know some kind of a, a deliberate impact, deliberate impact in such a way that uh, readers and listeners uh, are left uh, with a sense of uh, mesmerizing you know it, they, it, these devices they mesmerize uh, the readers and the uh, and the uh, listeners uh, as part of that as part of uh, our understanding of uh, figures of speech we discussed uh, you know various sound devices such as uh, alliteration assonance consonants onomatopoeia uh, we discussed uh, uh, figures of speech such as simile, metaphor, personification and all that. So, in this class we are going to further our understanding of uh, these figures of speech and as I said uh, you know uh, there are more than 250 figures of speech and obviously for want of uh, uh, time and space we will not be covering all of them. These are some of the predominant figures of speech that you uh, come across uh, in uh, various literary pieces. So, today's class we are going to begin with a discussion of metonymy you know please uh, pay attention to this particular uh, figure of speech it is again a very important figure of speech. Uh, metonymy again has a Greek uh, origin Greek root which means a kind of a changing of name you know a change of name you can call it a change of name. So, what happens here? we are going to replace when we use it we replace an idea or a subject by another idea or a subject or a thing which has close relationship with what we are discussing you know so let's say for instance i want to discuss a so rather than directly jumping into discussing a i make use of y which has some kind of you know parallels between uh, uh, a which shares some kind of relationship with between x and then make use of it you know something like this. So, uh, metonymy. So, again why do we do it because literature you know creates uh, some kind of you know rather than approaching a subject directly it creates some kind of a gap in our understanding it is a deliberate gap that is created. So, that you know that, gra that gap can act as a creating a fresh perspective that is the reason why as I said all these figures of speech they enhance the impact no doubt when you use them you know you are going to create uh, 
an extraordinary impact on your uh, listeners or readers. And uh, usually metonymy is used uh, abundantly in uh, many of uh, idioms and phrases. You know. So, when you say head count for instance, uh, it is a, a very interesting uh, idiom head count do the head count. What do you mean by that? It is not just the head you count the head here stands for you know an entire person something like this you know or when you say from the cradle to the grave you know human journey is uh, between from cradle to the gra grave you can describe uh, human life as a kind of a journey from cradle to the grave. What do we mean by that? Here cradle symbolizes birth and grave symbolizes you know death. So, birth and death are replaced uh, by you know cradle and grave. So, this is an apt uh, example for metonymy you know. Uh, we have some well known uh, sayings uh, in English you must have heard of this statement the pen is mightier than the sword. So, here the keywords are pen mightier and sword obviously, you know when you use it you do not mean literally that is why I said most of these figures are figures of speeches they deal with a figurative language you know that is why it is called a figure of speech figurative dimension of a language. So, pen is uh, not a pen here pen stands for an intellectual activity writing language sword may stand for physical power. So, always uh, uh, the intellectual powers are better than let us say physical power something like that you know in order to it has uh, multiple meanings, but in order to convey something similar we use pen and sword you know again this is a part of uh, a symbolic use of language you know. And when you say the bench delivered the verdict. So, when uh, you hear uh, of a, uh, a judge pronouncing judgment you know we say the bench gave the verdict delivered the verdict here the bench stands for you know judge. So, this is how bench comes to replace judge, but meaning is enhanced in the process meaning is enhanced metonymy here one object or one thing replaces another. We have uh, another uh, similar figure of speech called synecdoche you know. So, it is slightly related to uh, metonymy, but there is a minor variation. So, we should not get confused uh, here even in synecdoche you know there is a replacement, but here rather than you know uh, 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 rather than uh, uh, any object replacing any other object here a part of the object replaces the whole object a part of it. Let us say for instance in the previous example we gave head count right. So, head is a part of human being when we use head count what we mean is count the number of people involved. So, therefore, head count is a better example in synecdoche. So, where the head a part of human being stands for uh, the entire human being right. So, something like this and uh, why do we use it again the it is a part of uh, symbolism it is a part of uh, uh, symbolic expression of language they help uh, writers bring in uh, variations you know ultimately uh, poetry is to break free from uh, uh, the mundane it is to break free from the routine you know to break ourselves free from the tyranny of the mundane poetry can also be defined as that you know it is a letting loose of uh, the tyranny uh, and embracing something new. So, all these expressions help poetry achieve that effect. When you use grey beard for instance here again beard grey beard stands for an old person you know a part of him replaces uh, the old person therefore, instead of saying you know an old man or an old person you can say grey beard. And similarly for uh, you know the crown the crown stands for the king or the queen monarchy it represents a monarchy you know. So, here is uh, an extraordinary example from Shakespeare's Julius and Caesar and I am sure you must have at least uh, 
heard this uh, you know dialogue if not read the entire play uh, you must have uh, at least come across uh, this particular these particular lines friends romans countrymen lend me your ears i come to bury caesar not to praise him so if you are interested in developing uh, oratorial skills or public speaking uh, many of us uh, you know who do this job we make use of this particular play a scene from this particular play and uh, use this particular use these particular lines uh, it's an interesting play you can read this here lend me your ears your ears is it's not that he's asking uh, uh, the audience to give their give, give him their ears your ears stands for entire attention i want your attention i want you to listen to me so apart ears represent the entire human being so these are some well known uh, examples i'm sure these examples help you understand the concept better a little better uh, yeah as i said uh, uh, easily you know we can uh, uh, you know there is a scope for uh, mistaking metonymy for synecdoche or the other way around but though there, there is one thing is common that here one thing replaces the other but in metonymy you know it's not a part replacing the whole it's one object replacing another object you know a linked there is a link but in synecdoche a part replaces the whole a part replaces the whole like the head stands for human being graybeard stands for the old person so a part replaces the whole that's a, a crucial distinction that you have to keep in mind when uh, using metonymy and synecdoche from uh, these two things uh, let's move on to euphemism uh, euphemism is another rhetoric uh, device and of course also used in poetry and becomes a figure of speech uh, here euphemism again it has uh, greek origin in uh, uh, greek eu as a root word stands for good you know therefore you have you can even think of eulogy speaking something good eulogizing eu l o g y or you can even uh, consider eugenics you know e u stands for good so euphemism is uh, stating an unpleasant thing in a very pleasant way most of the times it becomes important because uh, remember words have the capacity to hurt us like words have the capacity to heal us words also have the capacity to hurt us therefore the challenge for the speaker the challenge for the writer is how to express a sentiment without using a harsher word that's where we make use of a euphemism you know thereby uh, it reduces uh, harshness in tone but you know maintains some sort of truthfulness nevertheless you know so while being truthful you're not being blunt in euphemism you are truthful you say whatever you wish to say but you are not blunt instead you express an unpleasant thing in a very pleasant way that's where you can uh, make use of uh, euphemism you know so generally euphemism is employed in order to discuss uh, taboo topics topics that are generally not discussed or even to infuse an element of humor you make use of euphemism now look at this in order to say that somebody is in jail you can say he or she is behind the bars behind the bars to a certain extent is capable of masking a harsher reality called jail so when you do not want your readers or listeners to completely get immersed into the harsher tonality of the word that's when you and i make use of euphemism and say behind the bars you know slightly a pleasant way you know when your intention is to put it that or when you say you know your pet uh, breathed its last so it's again a euphemism for you lost your pet your pet died so another example in uh, poetry uh, if i can read this if i pass during some nocturnal blackness mothy and warm when the hedgehog travels furtively over the lawn 
look at the expression when I pass during some nocturnal blackness. Death here is represented as nocturnal blackness and the uh, idea of somebody dying becomes you know when I pass during some nocturnal blackness, how the idea of uh, death and euphemism uh, like uh, metaphor, uh, metonymy, synecdoche as I said helps you to uh, bring in some kind of a distance, some kind of a distance, an intended distance, you know, an intended distance, so that uh, when you understand its meaning, it comes after a pause and has the capacity to give you a kind of a revelation. So, these are uh, some kind of poetic devices writers use to bring in various effects. So, depending on what effect, what impact you want to create, you make use of these devices. Then comes uh, hyperbole, hyperbole, hyperbole is a very, very uh, interesting uh, figure of speech, you know. Simply put hyperbole is an exaggeration to the core, an overstatement. There is a word called exaggeration, but it is exaggeration taken to the, pow taken to the power of n hyperbole you can call exaggeration taken to the power of n, right. So, you exaggerate a fact so much and this figure of speech uh, is so common that uh, you know you and I keep uh, using it when we have not met a friend in many years we say oh we have not met in ages, it has been ages since we last met. What we mean is it has been quite a long time. So, without knowing it when we use it, you know, we will have used hyperbole, a very beautiful, interesting figure of speech that writers uh, use, you know. And when used in advertisements, uh, they, I mean, usually they are also used in advertisements in order to uh, create a kind of a, a solid impact. Now, when Coca Cola says, when you open the bottle of uh, a Coke, you know, it says you would be opening happiness. Now, look at this, when you open a bottle of coke, it is like opening happiness, you know something like that, again uh, an exaggeration, uh, you know or too much of an exaggeration, a hyperbole, a use of, uh, a perfect use of hyperbole. Or when you have watched a Red Bull advertisement, it says, you know, when you consume it, when you drink it, it gives you wings to connote uh, the sense of liberation uh, a consumer feels after drinking it, you know, you say it gives you wings, all these are overstatements, exaggerations, you know. And Disneyland, if you have been to Disneyland or if you have heard of Disneyland, you know, this is uh, the tagline, the tagline says the happiest place on earth, the happiest place on earth, obviously these are, these are uh, exercises in uh, hyperbole, hyperbole. So, I have uh, a very interesting poetic use, uh, these are not exhaustive, these are just illustrative, we must always keep this point in mind uh, whenever we are listening to these lectures. An hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze. So, he says to his beloved and uh, the poetic persona to his coy mistress, the poet says when referring to his beloved, he says probably I might need a hundred years in order to praise you, you know, I might need a hundred years to praise you, probably the highest compliment uh, you could uh, give to your beloved, right, you know, a hundred years or even when you say a hundred years of solitude, I am sure you must have come across that extraordinary uh, uh, piece of fiction, Marquez, you know, 100 years of solitude, again hyperbole, hyperbole. Yeah, uh, from hyperbole, let us go to antimetabole, it is called an antimetabole. Here, uh, what happens is, uh, there is a set of uh, clauses or phrases and they have some kind of parallel constructions here. Here you have two sets of phrases or two sets of clauses, right. So, but the 
the second set you know reverses you know there is a kind of a reversal of the pattern in the second set thereby you are going to add an extra layer of meaning here you are going to add an extra layer of me meaning you know so in a sense you know you are going to create a kind of a balance by you know by saying something different in the second part you create some kind of a balance you create a, you know uh, balance when you reverse uh, when you reverse the order as I said you create a, a sort of a balance. Now, look at these examples I am sure when you look at these examples it becomes clear and to metaboly. We shape our building and afterwards our buildings shape us. Now, look at you know a kind of a, uh, 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 a climatic kind of a change you know uh, it is an extraordinary reversal you know when you reverse the phrasings here we shape our buildings initially we shape our buildings and later our buildings shape us almost you know a clever play on the word a clever play on the word of course we are going to discuss uh, uh, a play on the word when we say play on the word of course the first thing that comes to our mind is a pun a pun is also a clever play on a particular word an antimetabole is a play on a set of words you can call them a set of words or phrases right yeah power does not add glory to people it's people who add glory to power most of us uh, you know many people think that the moment uh, they occupy a chair you know the chair go i mean dictates uh, what they need to do but in the hands of better people the chair gets the character of these people it's not the chair changing a being human being it's a human being changing the character of the chair again when we say chair it's a i'm sure you must have recognized the figure of speech we have used the chair here stands for a position of power you know metonymy right we discussed it just a while ago so this is how uh, a clever reversal of phrases creates a dramatic impact i know what i like but I like what I know all the more you know look at this clever know and like when reversed what kind of an impact they are going to create here. Yeah antithesis or an antithesis you know antithesis is what happens two contradictory ideas two contradictory phrases are put next to each other in other words it is a juxtaposition of one idea with another idea which is almost opposite to it symmetrically opposite something like that okay a contrasting idea put together so as to again create balance some kind of a balance here now i'm sure you must have uh, again uh, read it or heard it somewhere you know neil armstrong's uh, description of uh, uh, the you know uh, the space voyage you know the voyage so this there is one small step for man one giant leap for mankind you know this step that you are keeping on the moon or going out of the or uh, you know it is like a giant uh, leap for mankind you know one small step for man a giant leap for mankind small step and giant leap put together to create a kind of an extraordinary dramatic impact you know and uh, now look at another one it is a, uh, a very well known uh, statement by Martin Luther King we must learn to live together or perish together as fools we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools though brothers and fools are not uh, opposites here but in a sense they can create that because brother stands for you know generally symbolize uh, a kind of living harmoniously uh, with each other fools foolish in the sense not very harmoniously but the main contradiction comes here between you know live together and perish together live and perish look at uh, the dramatic change of the meaning and another well known thing is better to reign in hell than serve in heaven probably it is a, a Miltonic statement you know better to rule in heaven than serve in heaven uh, better to rule in hell than serve in heaven of course that is uh, a debatable thing uh, I am not endorsing that uh, 
opinion, I am just using it only of course to uh, make us understand the concept of antithesis. All right. So, these are some examples I am sure these constructions you need to focus a little more on these constructions so that you understand intuitively what these figures of speech are. From uh, uh, all these things we move on to uh, some more important uh, figures of speech these are paradox and oxymoron you know uh, we need to pay careful attention to how oxymoron is uh, pronounced oxymoron you know it is not moron oxymoron the stress is on m mo part. Okay. A paradox is again uh, a statement in which first part appears to contradict uh, itself you know first part appears to contradict itself. I can give you a very famous uh, story for this you know imagine a huge stone tablet you know hanging in mid air defying gravity that itself is a great wonder right if there is an object that defies gravity and hangs uh, somewhere in mid air. So, on the one side of it when you come face to face with it it says whatever that is written on the other side is true and when you go to the other side and see there it says you know whatever that is written on the other side is false. Now, you begin scratching your head this side says what is written on the other side is true and the other side says what is written on this side is false what is it doing it is trying to one side is trying to contradict the other side. So, the crux of it uh, can be called a paradox you know I mean this entire combination is powered by paradox of course what do you mean by that that is a this particular uh, story or an image that I gave you plays a very important role in uh, uh, Greek culture. So, if time permits we can take it up at some other stage and uh, ask you what exactly you understand by that. So, but that is an example for you know a paradox. A well known example for paradox is uh, a statement from uh, you know or a line from George Orwell's uh, iconoclastic novel called uh, you know uh, animal form. So, if time permits please read that uh, uh, short novel it is a novella we might discuss it uh, during our uh, discussion of uh, fiction you know during our class on fiction please read it if time permits. So, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than the others. Well, it should confuse us right because on the one hand you say everybody is equal and on the other hand you say some are more equal than others. So, how does it it flies in the face of the first statement and it confounds us you know it confounds us. But sometimes these kind of contradictions uh, are a part of life because see contradiction uh, well in logic it may not be appropriate, but in life contradiction is a part of understanding life coming to terms with uh, a diversity and multitude of life. That is why you know when somebody uh, tells Walt Whitman he is a, a renowned uh, transcendentalist American poet uh, who has had a significant influence uh, uh, on poets and writers the world over you know somebody tells him that you know you contradict yourself then he seemed to have said uh, well I am large I contain multitudes. So, prob probably the path to uh, multitude has to go through contradiction we do not know you know, but again contradiction may not be an ideal way in communication, but in life that is essential to understand the diversity of life uh, the paradoxes of life and things like that right and another important thing that Gandhi says uh, whatever you do in life will be insignificant nevertheless it is important that you do it insignificant and important. If everything I do is insignificant why should I do it why should it be important that I do it well probably uh, when you realize uh, that uh, you know we need to build our own purposes in life life as such existentially may not give us any purpose because when we are created when we are born here it is not that well uh, if we are not fatalistic then we can say there is no purpose defined every human being has to 
chalk out his or her own path. So, uh, in order to uh, explain that probably Gandhi uses this uh, paradoxical statement you know. Uh, so, these are some uh, very important uh, figures of speech. We might have uh, one or two more let us take a look at it. Irony again irony is an important thing and without you and I knowing that we are using irony we keep using it. Irony can be attained in very many ways. Irony is there when you it is it is a verbal irony, situational irony there are different uh, examples to that. So, when you say in an example now look at this oh I love spending big bucks said my dad a notorious uh, penny pincher. Somebody who is uh, uh, miserly says that uh, they love spending big bucks what could be more ironic than that. So, this you can call it a verbal irony you know irony achieved uh, using words to convey the meaning irony of course, is to convey you use a word in order to convey a meaning which is opposite to the word you use which is opposite to the word that you use you know something like that. If a word means x well you have used that word in order to convey y which is an opposite of x right. So, something like this and uh, now if it is a thunderstorm if you are caught in the middle of a thunderstorm if you say oh what a beautiful and pleasant weather we have here today that means it is a situational irony. Well, uh, you are trying to say an unpleasant thing, uh, but you are trying to express it in a pleasant way it is not euphemism, but it is irony because you are not exactly enjoying the weather you are sarcastic you are ironically you are using it it is called a situational irony. From irony we come to pun you know a pun is a very important uh, uh, thing you know it is a play on the word it is a play on the word here a pun makes use of uh, multiple meanings associated with a particular word uh, multiple meanings associated with a particular word. So, therefore, you say pun intended when you want to convey that what you say has multiple meanings attached to it you say pun is intended you know. So, it is this pun is uh, again uh, it can be you know based on similar spelling or it can be based on you know especially in writing uh, it is based on a similar spelling when you say it it is based on the, uh, the way you sound these things. Now, look at this example the tallest building in the town is the library it has thousands of stories. So, thousands of stories stories is spelling is different, but if you can replace stories with story s t o r e y you know. So, multiple uh, you know uh, floors building has multiple floors for that story we use of it, but he since it is a, a, a library it also has stories multiple stories you know thousands of stories a pun on that you know that means it is true that this library has uh, plenty of uh, stories and it also has plenty of stories you know something like that architecturally speaking. And uh, again the other one is I used to be a banker, but I lost interest now look at the use of the word interest you know interest here can mean two things one the interest that you earn on money and the other is losing interest in something. So, we do not know which he means probably both you know. So, this is a classic case of pun. So, I am sure all these things have given you an idea about uh, uh, you know how figures of speech are used. So, what I am going to give you I am going to give you an extraordinary poem you know. So, let us see if you have uh, based on your understanding of uh, figures of speech that we have discussed uh, in these two classes if you can uh, identify at least a few of them. This is an extraordinary poem uh, by Banner called the heart of the tree for want of time I will not be able to read this entire poem, but what you can do you can take a screenshot of it. I am sure uh, you should be able to identify at least uh, 8 to 10 figures of speech that we have discussed in the class metaphor yes, alliteration yes consonance yes, assonance yes, personification yes, metonymy yes, synecdoche probably just think of it. 
So, there are different figures of speech employed at least you should be able to spot 8 to 10 of them. A beautiful remarkable poem you know if you want to inspire somebody to you know uh, towards nature if you want to uh, inspire somebody to uh, lean towards nature or if you want to encourage them for you know uh, you can give them this poem the heart of the tree what does he plant when he plants a tree what does he plant when he plants a tree he plants a friend of sun and sky now look at this when you plant a tree you plant a friend of sun and sky so a tree is called a friend to the sun and sky and again the heart of the tree what is the figure of speech used in the title itself a, an extraordinary a remarkable poem please read it and identify it okay thank you